it sucks us down like the law of gravity. It causes endless problems for us, problems that don't need to be there, problems that distract us from what we could be doing, problems that, that make us do shameful and embarrassing things that we can't erase. This is what ego does, right? Lane Kiffin, the, the football coach, has been a big fan and booster of my works over the years. He read Ego is the Enemy at one of the lower points in his career, and it's, he sort of credits it with, with helping him get back to where he is, which today is the head football coach at Ole Miss, which is having an incredible run. The, the, the program has had a historic season in, in a bunch of ways, and he was nice enough to ask me to come talk today. So I'm here in Oxford, Mississippi. I just went for a long run to see the campus. I wanted to see some of the civil rights markers. I wanted to see the Walk of Champions. I wanted to get in the right headspace to, in a little less than an hour, go talk to the football players at Ole Miss and hopefully impart to them and to you, because I'm going to post it, some stoic wisdom that we can use in our actual lives. Whether we're athletes or entrepreneurs, professors or professional writers, I think there's something in stoicism for all of us today. I'm going to be talking to Ole Miss and I'm going to share that with you. With our speaker series today, uh, personally, I'm thankful for our speaker today. Uh, I was introduced to him kind of by one of our coaches who told me that I had an ego and then sent me like an audio book of a synopsis of a book that he wrote, Ego is the Enemy. Although I didn't think that applied, he had me think about myself a little bit more and think about some of the things that I was going through. And so I took a deeper dive into some of the other books that he had written. How I many of you all are familiar with the term, if it was easy, then everybody would do it? Well, one of the books that our speaker today has written is Obstacle is the Way. And uh, one of the quotes that comes from that is the obstacle in the path becomes the path. Never forget within every obstacle is an opportunity that one can improve on our own condition. Uh, we don't really control what happens to us in life, but we can control how we respond to it. And uh, just some of the things that he has written through the five million books that he sold, uh, worldwide trans, uh, translated 30 different times have been inspirational for me, and I'm sure that his message today will impact each and every one of us. So let me introduce you all to Ryan Holiday. Thank you so much. Nobody ever thinks he goes the enemy applies to them, so we're good. All right. <clears throat> I feel like I can relate a little bit to where all of you are. I, I didn't play college sports, but when I was 19 or 20 years old, I, I had the burning desire to do something. I wanted to be great at what I did. I wanted to be world class. I wanted to be different than my sort of parents' small, ordinary life. I, I wanted to be elite at what I do, which is writing. And that was, that was what motivated me to get out of bed every morning. That's what inspired me. That's what excited me. And I came across a book when I was your age, when I was in college, I was sitting in my college apartment and this book came and it changed the course of my life. And the philosophy in that book is what I want to talk about today because it's what helped me do that. There we go. This book, The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, Marcus Aurelius is the emperor of Rome. Uh, I usually tell people that he's the old guy in the movie Gladiator that Joaquin Phoenix character kills, but I was talking to Jeff Okuda, the, the third pick in the 2020 draft, and I was telling him about Marcus Aurelius in the movie Gladiator. He had no idea what I was talking about, and then I realized he was two years old when the movie came out. Uh, so maybe you guys don't know Gladiator, but Marcus Aurelius is the most powerful man in the world. He oversees an enormous empire. Uh, and he sits down every night and he writes some notes to himself about how to be better, about how to be great, about how to be excellent at what he did. And uh, this was in the long ago days before Amazon Prime. So I had to buy some other books to get free shipping. And then I had to wait like a week before it arrived. And finally, this book comes and it, it hits me like a ton of bricks. There's this great expression, a quake book, right? A book that shakes the foundation that you live in. And that's what that's what Marcus Aurelius' Meditations was for me. This is my copy. I, I put the miles on it over the years. It's all taped together. But this book, it, it shapes and it changes me. The, I know when people hear ancient philosophy, that doesn't feel practical or accessible, right? These are, these are questions that professors ask, that professors think about. We don't think of philosophers as real people in the real world 
doing real things, but they were. Marcus Aurelius is the emperor. There's Stoics who were writers. There's Stoics who were generals. There's Stoics who were, who were athletes, who performed and participated in the Olympics in that time. Philosophy in the ancient world wasn't something you talked about, something you thought about. Philosophy was something you did. It was how you lived your life. And so this book that I read at 18 or 19 years old, it, it shakes me in so many ways. It changes how I think about things. And I, I, I've had the unique privilege now of, of, because of this book, because of the ideas that we're going to talk about today, to, to be able to travel all over the world and sell millions of books. And I, I've gotten to speak to elite groups like you guys. I, I spoke to the, the Army Rangers yesterday. Uh, I've been able to speak to a number of NFL teams, professional athletes, great college program. Uh, it's, it's been cool to see this obscure thing that isn't supposed to be practical and usable make its way into real people's lives, which is what philosophy has actually been for 2,000 years. It's been used by people in pursuit of what's called erite. Erite is the Greek word for excellence, right? For virtue, for being great at what you do. And as I've, as I've got to talk to all these groups, I've, I've figured out some ways that we can take this, again, theoretical concept and apply it to what we do. Uh, this is my book, Next Play, Conway, Super Bowl, Game Ball. Um, it's, been, it's been cool to, to, to see this play out. And oh, here's Coach. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. What I thought we would talk about today, because uh, I realize you guys go to lectures all the time, you get talked at all the time. I wanted to talk about five usable practices from Stoic philosophy that you can apply in your life, that I have to apply in my life, that your coaches try to apply in their lives, that, that everyone, whether they're trying to make it in the pros, whether they're just trying to, to get through to graduation, whether they're trying to deal with being stuck in traffic, how do we apply these ancient practices to be great personally and professionally? Because that's really what Stoicism is about. And Stoicism starts with a really simple question. What is in my control? This is called the dichotomy of control. It's the chief and most basic practice of Stoic philosophy. It starts with the fact that there's everything in the world, everything that could happen, everything that everyone else is doing, all the situations we find ourselves in, and then there's this tiny little bit of that we control. Epictetus, who's a, who's a Roman slave, who becomes a Stoic philosopher, talks about how there are the things that are within our control, within our power, and that there are things that are not. And the chief task in life is to find out what those are. A thing is either up to you or it isn't up to you, right? And the main task is to separate these things into their proper categories so we know how to treat them, so we know how to respond to them. What do you control? And I want you to think about this question today and for the rest of the season. Is this up to me? Is this in my control? Because at the end of the day, what you control primarily more than anything else is just how you play. Right? You don't control the playing time, you don't control whether a coach likes you, you don't control anything but how you play, how you act in each individual moment. You control how you play. Right? You don't control the weather on the game day, right? You control how you play. You don't control what the refs do, you don't control what the other team does, you control how you play. You don't control what they say about you, you don't control what they think about you, right? You don't control what your parents say. You don't control the media. You don't control social media. You control how you play. You control your thoughts. You control your emotions. You control your decisions. You control your effort. That's it. That's it, right? Going back to Epictetus, you can imagine this guy is a slave. So his power is radically shrunk. But he realizes in Rome, as he lives in the palace with the emperor, the emperor Nero, he realizes that he's freer than many of the people around him because they're addicted to things, because they're, they want power, they want approval, because they want more than what they already have. They're slaves to their urges, right? They're slaves to their ambitions. They're slaves to circumstances. They're, they're slaves to their preferences. But he, by focusing on what's up to him, his thoughts, his actions, his opinions, he's freer than they are. So we don't control what happens. This is the core principle of Stoic philosophy. We don't control what happens, but we always control how we respond to what happens. So in, in some sense, it's, it's, it's admitting, it's accepting how powerless we are in this world. 
right? We don't control the weather. We don't control where, we're, where we come from. We don't control what other people are doing. We don't control that, 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 that such a big chunk of your time here has been affected by a pandemic. But you control how you play, right? You control what you do about it. You control how you respond to it. You control what you make of it, right? And the person who is most focused on what they control will win. They have the advantage. If you think about us having a finite amount of energy, a finite amount of resources, every second, every minute, every every ounce of energy that we focus on whether something's fair or not, whether we like something or not, whose fault something is, how we wish it was otherwise, right? What we want to change about all of that is change. All of that is taking resources and energy away from what we do about it, how we respond, right? We don't control what happens, we control how we respond to what happens. And that leads to this idea, the obstacle is the way, which is important enough to me that I have it tattooed on my arm here. The obstacle is the way is focusing on how we respond to what has happened. So I'll take you back to Marcus Aurelius' time in Rome. This is 165 AD and the plague hits Rome. It's called the Antonine Plague, it comes from the east, it's like COVID on steroids. It's the worst thing that's ever happened. Millions of people died. Rome is overwhelmed. And, and Marcus is stuck there in the middle of it, right? And not just a plague, but then there's historic flooding, then there's a war, then there's just the difficulties of running this enormous empire. It's one thing after another. And one ancient historian, Cassius Gaius, says that Marcus did not have the good fortune that he deserved. His whole reign is involved in a series of troubles. And maybe you think about that about your college career. Maybe you think about that in your life. You wish that things had been better. You wish that it had been easier. You wish it had been set up the way that you wanted it to set up. You didn't meet with the good luck that you deserved or that you have seen other people get. That's just how it goes, right? Marcus writes in meditations, and I remember reading this at 19 years old. He says, it's unfortunate that this happened, right? He's feeling sorry for himself for a second. Then he catches himself and he says, no, it's fortunate that this happened to me because I'm strong enough to deal with it. I'm going to turn it into something. And that's actually what leaders say. Leaders say better me than somebody else, right? Better me than a weaker person, better me than a, a less well-trained person, better me than someone with fewer resources, right? So he says, it's fortunate that this happened. And this is what the Stoics are saying, that we have the power to die events with our own color. Right? We have the power to focus on how we respond. We have the power to tell ourselves a positive story about what has happened. So is this situation unfortunate? Is the, the, the thing you're dealing with, the injury, the setback, the bad grades, the, the, the problems at home, is it unfortunate or is it fortunate? You get to decide. You get to choose what becomes of it. You get to choose whether you become better for it. You get to choose how you step up and deal with it. You get to change, you get to control how you respond to it. We always control how we respond. That's the one part of it that's up to us. Mark Spears in meditation says, look, stuff can get in the way. There's no question, right? We can be impeded. Our plans can be disrupted, but we have this superpower of being able to adapt and change and reroute. And, and use that thing, because the mind adapts and converts to its own purposes, the obstacle to our action. It says the impediment to action advances actions. What stands in the way becomes one, right? This is what the obstacle is the way means. It's not that everything bad can be wonderful. It's that by dealing with the frustrating and the difficult and the painful and the inopportune and the unexpected, we have the opportunity to rise to the occasion. We have the chance always to practice virtue or erite, right? We have the chance to be excellent, perhaps not in the way we want it to be, right? You're, you have all these big plans for, these, for the season. You have everything you want to do on the field, and then suddenly an injury changes that. But you still have the opportunity to step up and be an excellent teammate, to be an excellent student, right? To be excellent in a number of other ways. Right? Nothing can stop us from deciding to be our best self at what we're able to do in that moment. That's what the obstacle is the way means. That we have the chance always to face what we are dealing with, with virtue and arrogance and excellence. We can be great even in frustrating and not so great circumstances. Andy Grove, one of the founders of Intel, he says, bad companies are destroyed by crisis. 
great companies survive that. Good companies survive that. Great companies are improved by that. And this is true for individual athletes. It's also true for teams, right? Are you a team that's so fragile when things fall apart, you fall apart? Or are you a team that becomes better for what you go through? You learn, you, 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 you understand that you've got an extra gear in there. You understand what's really important. You understand why you do this, right? That's what we can take from these obstacles. And so the Stoics have this concept of a more fati, which means a love of faith. It means instead of wanting it to be a certain way, instead of resenting that it's not the way that you want it to be, instead of lamenting the situation that you have to deal with, instead of just muddling through and surviving it, you go, no, this is chosen for me. This is the best possible thing that could happen to me. And I'm going to turn it into something that in retrospect, I wouldn't want it to have been any other way. That's what the obstacle is the way. And then that leads to this idea of, of ego, right? And my argument is that the biggest obstacle that we face, that you face, that countries and nations and teams, sports face, it's not an external thing. It's not the people that you're lining up against. Uh, it's not the people you're competing for a spot with. It's not, uh, it's not anything outside. The, 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 the opponent is never on the outside. The biggest obstacle for every leader and organization and team and player, right, is you. It's inside you. Ego, right? Empires collapse from within. We do these things to ourselves. That's where ego is so dangerous. Ego is this insidious force that, that warps our thinking, that disconnects us, that screws us up. There's a, there's a 2,000 year old poem here. He says, the first thing that the gods bestow on one they would destroy is pride, right? That you're better than other people, that you're special, that the rules don't apply, that everything you do is fantastic, that you can't be criticized, that you deserve this, right? Pride holds us back. Pride prevents us from getting better. Pride goes before the fall, right? Ego is the enemy because it's this force that sucks us down like gravity that prevents us from being what we're capable of being, right? Now, when I talk about ego, people go, but isn't a little bit of ego important, right? And I would make the distinction between ego and confidence. Confidence is something you earn. Confidence is based on the results on what you have accomplished. Ego is this sense that uh, you're invincible, that it's all about you, that you're the center of the universe. It's that voice whispering in your head that you're, uh, you're magical and important and destined for all these things. No, the humble person who's trying to earn it, who's focused not just on where they're good, but also on where they can be better, that's the person who is continually getting better. Right, and I've seen this. I was the director of marketing in a company called American Apparel in my 20s, biggest fashion company in the United States, the largest garment manufacturer in North America, it's worth over a billion dollars. I watched the founder evaporate $500 million of his own wealth because he couldn't take feedback. He couldn't surround himself from people, with people who challenged him. He couldn't follow the rules. He couldn't be organized. He couldn't be structured. He was an undisciplined mess. And he drove his company into bankruptcy and, and 10,000 people lost their jobs. This is what ego does, right? It sucks us down like the law of gravity. It causes endless problems for us, problems that don't need to be there, problems that distract us from what we could be doing, problems that, that make us do shameful and embarrassing things that we can't erase, right? Problems that send us to jail, potentially, as, as both these uh, examples show, right? Uh, problems that, that make us uh, like the worst human being in the entire world, right? Pro the ego prevents us from doing hard things. It prevents us from working with other people. It prevents us from connecting. Right? Ego, as they, they define it in Alcoholics Anonymous, I love this definition, is that ego is a conscious separation from. Right? To be great, you have to be in touch with reality. You can't live in your own head. You can't live in your fantasies. You have to have an, an accurate and a self-aware understanding of all your strengths and weaknesses, of the whole picture. You have to stay hungry. Right? And ego gets in there and prevents us from doing that. Right? Ego makes everything about us about how you're better than everything and everyone, right? And that's not true, especially now, right? You're still in the ascendancy phase of what you're trying to do. Pat Riley talks about the disease of me. And he says that a team, a person, an organization starts out on the, on the innocent climb, 
That's when they're all on the same page. That's when they're working together. That's when they're sublimating and, 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 and reducing ego to work together to accomplish something together. But then what happens is ego intervenes. The disease of me, he says, can strike any winning team in any year at any moment. We have to keep ego away. Ego doesn't help teams come together. Ego doesn't help people uh, collaborate. Ego doesn't help people realize their potential. It is the impediment to those things. And we've seen this play out in Kyrie Irving's career, one of the greatest basketball players to ever do it. Right? He's drafted number one by the Cleveland Browns, uh, the, or by, the, by the Cleveland Cavaliers. He comes there, this is after LeBron leaves. He's, he's great, he's rookie of the year, but the team is not that great. And so LeBron comes back and they go to three straight NBA finals. They win one of them. Uh, so you might think this is incredible, right? You're a great basketball player. You're playing with the greatest basketball player who ever lived. And uh, you win a championship together. And you almost win two other ones. Um, but not for Kyrie, not for someone who can't control their ego. In fact, Kyrie never wanted LeBron James to come to back to the Cavaliers because he was worried it would overshadow him. Right, and it kind of did. He was mad that LeBron James got special treatment. LeBron James got to bring friends on the plane, and Kyrie didn't. Um, this is a, a, a knock on, on LeBron, too. He didn't understand that, hey, not everyone was in the same boat as him. Not everyone had already won a championship. Not everyone had already made hundreds of millions of dollars. But the two of them, their egos get in the way, and it tears apart the Cavs, right? They had multiple championships left in them, and that doesn't happen. Um, but this is what ego is. There's, a, there's an ancient expression, the character is fate. Ego is this self-fulfilling prophecy. It just follows him around and it tears things apart. He gets to Boston and very quickly his ego infects that team and tears it apart. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, if you want some evidence of ego, Kyrie believes that the world is flat. Uh, ego is thinking that you know more than literally every scientist <laughs> and scholar and astrologer who has ever lived. Uh, and then uh, he goes to Brooklyn, and here he is on an incredible team, one of the greatest teams ever assembled. And he might not even make the playoffs this year. Um, he, Kyrie, again, his ego tears a team apart. And look, I don't want to get into the politics of, of vaccines, but I thought his stance on vaccines, contrasting it, to the stance that this organization and team has done, which credit to all of you, I think was an incredible statement of, of selflessness and sacrifice and, and, and empathy and, and, and goodness. But Kyrie says, I'm doing what's best for me. You play a team sport, dude. That's the definition of what you don't get to do, right? When you play a team sport, it can't be all about you. It has to be about something bigger than you. But ego gets in there, it gets in between, and it prevents us from what we're capable of. So it's not that egotistical people are never successful. Kyrie is very successful. He's made millions of dollars. He's won an NBA championship. But it is indisputable that his ego, his selfishness, his know-it-allness has cost him one, two, three, four champions. I don't know, but two, an incredible number of wins and accomplishments have been pushed out of reach. It's like it's like every time he gets there, ego pushes it just a little bit further and makes it impossible for him to reach it. That's what ego causes. It's not that successful people don't have egos. It's that egos hold successful people back from being as successful as they are capable of being. Right? Epictetus says it's impossible to learn what you think you already know. Right? That's, again, I think the world is flat. I think I know more than, than, than uh, a virologist and the epidemiologist. I know more. I'm better than you. The problem with ego is that it prevents us from getting better because it thinks we're as good as we're capable of being. Emerson conversely says everyone that we meet is better than us at something. And we should focus on learning from them. So what ego does is it puts in, in place a mechanism that allows us to get better. Right? Because it exposes us to all the deficiencies or flaws or opportunities that we have to get better. This is a quote from a physicist, John Lewis. He says, as your island of knowledge grows, you're exposed to a greater shoreline of ignorance. Meaning, as you learn more about the game of football, as you progress in this game, you're suddenly exposed to things that you didn't even know you didn't know about. 
right? At first you were just trying to master your position, then you were trying to master the game, and now maybe you're thrust in the position of being a captain, or uh, you're, you're, you're forced to learn a new position, right? As you get better, you're thrust into all sorts of circumstances where if you're not hungry to keep learning and get better, if you think you're perfect, you are frozen in place. So the reason that great people are actually humble is that this humility is what allows them to continue to get better, right? Tom Brady doesn't walk around thinking that he's the GOAT. Tom Brady isn't even obsessed with winning, he says. What he's obsessed with is getting better. And this mechanism of not focusing on how great we are, but on all the opportunities we have for improvement is what allows us to get better and be the best at what we do. So all of you are students, right? You are a student athlete, I get it. But don't think of being a student as something that ends when, you're, when your school time ends, right? There's a difference between school and education. And if we focus on always remaining a student of our craft, right, of being a human being, of being a, being a student, of being a spouse, being a student of, of the game, of being an athlete, of, of, of the sport, right, of business, if we focus on always being a student, we always get better and we keep ego away. Now, this idea of stillness, which I have here on my wrist, stillness is what allows us to access that humility, what allows us to, to, to tap into that perseverance or that, that tenacity. Stillness is when we slow things down, right? Every morning I wake up very early, the first thing I do is I take my kids for a long walk outside. We watch the sun come up, we're outside, we're, we're connected with nature, we have some quiet time before the craziness of the day. And then the next thing I do is I sit down with some journals and I just write to myself, I'm working through like Marcus Reelius was, what I'm struggling with, what I'm afraid of, where I'm falling short, what I, what I wanna get better at, what I'm excited about. And I, I access this stillness because it allows me to do what I do. It allows me to write. Mark Shavuna says we have to learn how to concentrate like a Roman, on doing what's in front of you with precise and genuine seriousness, tenderly, willingly, justly, freeing yourself from distraction. It is a busy world out there, but you all know, you've, you've touched this feeling before. At your best moments of peak performance, you weren't thinking of 50 other things. You weren't you weren't frantic. In fact, right, when the game, when, when you run into the two minute drill, even though things are crazier than ever, right, that's when you're at your most still, your most connected. The game, you can feel the game slowing down. You can feel yourself locking in. Well, you need to access that all the time, not just in moments of great significance, but the closer you can get to that on a daily basis, the better you will be at what you do and the happier you will be at what you do. This is General James Mattis, a four-star general in the Marines, who's Secretary of Defense. He says, the single biggest problem for leadership in the information age is a lack of reflection. He says, you need solitude, you need space, you need, you need some stillness in your life. And look, you live on one of the most beautiful campuses in America. Uh, you, you, you have to access that, you have to find time to get that reflection, to get that space to think and reflect. But also to have that, it's going to require eliminating some things. Mark Trudeau says we have to ask ourselves in every moment, is this essential? Right? Because most of what we do and say, we can commit it to, we find ourselves doing, is not essential. We're just doing it because somebody asked us. We're just doing it because we used to do it. Right? We're too busy to have this stillness and this space in our life. This is a picture I have on my wall between two pictures of my kids. It was given to me by a, a sports psychologist who works for the Mets and for Major League Baseball. It's, just, it's a picture of this, this Dr. Oliver Sacks, and, and Oliver Sacks has a sign behind him on his desk, just said no. What are you saying no to? In fact, your default should be no. People are asking you to do this, they're asking you to do that. They, they want to know if you want to go here or go there. What about this opportunity? What about that opportunity? The answer is no, right? Because you have something more important that you're focused on. This is a letter that someone sent, uh, this is the, the, the writer, E.B. White. He says, thank you for your letter inviting me to be on this commission. I must decline for secret reasons, right? Um, don't be afraid to, to piss people off or to be laughed at or to be out of things. Forget fear of missing out. To be great at what you do, right, academically and athletically, 
You need focus. You need you need to widow the amount of things that are on your plate and on your mind so you can be 100% locked in on that stuff. Think about it this way. Everything you say yes to is saying no to something else. It's saying no to uh, extra practice, extra game, extra film time, extra time with your teammates, right? When you're saying yes to things, you're saying no to other things, right? When you say no to something, you're saying yes to the things that matter. Uh, I've been lucky enough to spend some time with the Rams. Uh, the motto of the Rams, less need the GM, he says the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, right? That means eliminating everything that is not the main thing. It's the only time you'll have here uh, playing football in college. Are you going to waste it doing a thousand other things? Or are you going to show up for it? Are you going to be focused for it? Are you going to are you going to clear your plate so you can be totally all in on that? And I would say one of the big enemies of stillness is, of course, this thing, the phone. Uh, I told you about my morning routine. Part of what I do when I wake up, when I go on that walk, when I do my journaling, my rule is I don't touch my phone for the first one hour that I'm awake. So I can have time to think, so I can have time to reflect, so that I can have time to be intentional, to set my intention for the day. I don't want to start my day with all the texts I got from my friends, with all the things that happened on social media, with all the things that happened in the news, right? I want you to start by creating some space in the morning, especially in those big game days, right? Don't start your day reactionary. Don't start your day in your bed, just mindlessly scrolling your phone. That is not a place that good work comes from. Uh, this is the coach of the Cardinals. They, he has to give the team breaks in the middle of the day, right? He has to break up a team meeting, an event like this, so people can go get their social media fix, right? That's an addiction, man. That's like a smoke break for social media. But what I want you to think about, when you think about the amount of time you have on your phone, and you can check it out, your phone will tell you how much you're using it each day. I want you to think about what you could do with that time, how it can make you a better athlete, right? How you can make, how it can make you a better student, how it can make you a better son or daughter, right? I hear from people uh, that go, oh, I don't have time to read, right? I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. But if I pulled up the screen time app on their phone, I could show them several hours that they had where they could have done that, right? You have the time, you just have to make the time. You have to prioritize the time. So I want you to think about it. As you think about your social media habits, as you think about your phone addiction, as you think about video games and screen time and all the things that we commit to that aren't really that important, what could you do with that time? And what would that time applied in this window allow you to do? And again, focus on what we control, we don't control. You don't control what the other athletes are doing, but this is a place that you can make up for time, right? Maybe someone started earlier than you. Maybe someone had more resources than you, right? Maybe they do, but you can make up for lost time. You can catch them. You can put some, uh, you, can, you can close some of that gap by not wasting your time, your free time, what you control. You can focus that on what matters. Who could you be if you focus? A couple years ago, I gave a talk to the Browns, and I talked about a lot of the same things. Focus on what you control, stay off social media. Uh, those are my two big messages. Um, there was big hopes for the Browns that year. They did not meet any of them. Uh, and then I, uh, I went and I was doing a piece about Baker Mayfield at the end of the season, and he basically said, you know what I did wrong this year? I focused too much on stuff that was outside of my control and I spent too much time on social media, right? That, but that's the cost. The cost of this distraction, of this, of this uh, trying to, to, to work on things we don't control, it comes at the cost of your performance on the field, in the classroom, and in life. And the reason I try not to lose myself, as you saying, the reason I try to focus that time is that I want to spend it on the things that are important to me. I want to spend it with my family. I want to spend it with my work. I want to spend it reading. I want to spend it improving. I want to spend it getting better. <coughs> so those three big ideas there, right? The idea that ego is the enemy, that the obstacle is the way, that stillness is the key, and the through line for all of them is this idea that we focus on what we control. But do I have time for one, one more quick one? Right, the last one I would give you, the last thought, this, this, this is a somewhat of a sobering exercise. I realize you're all very young, uh, so maybe this isn't something you think about, but I was lucky enough to work on a book with Chris Bosch. And in 2016, Chris laces up his shoes, he heads out on the court. It's a game, the Heat are playing the Spurs, and 
and he has no knowledge at that moment that it would be the last time that he ever played professional basketball, right? Now, he's lucky in that uh, it wasn't a cancer diagnosis, it wasn't a fatal car crash, right? It wasn't uh, a fatal case of COVID. Um, it's just a, a, a blood clot in his leg that means he can't pass the physical, he can't play in the NBA anymore. Um, it was the last time he got to do the thing he loved more than anything in the world. And the reality is all of us will have that moment, right? Life is very short. Life is not in our control. Uh, unexpected things happen, right? Uh, there was the moment the last time that all of you went out and played football in the street with your friends. There will be the last game you play at Ole Miss. There will be the last game you play in college. Maybe there's the last time you play in front of a cheering crowd ever. So the reason we need the stillness, the reason we want to focus on what we control, all of the factors that lead up to that is not up to us. But do we soak it in? Are we present for it? Do we show up for it? Do we give our best for it? That's, that's what we control. So the Stoic practice, and, and I carry a coin that says this in my pocket, memento mori, remember that you are mortal. right? And, and again, mortality is not something you, you think about when you're 18, 19 years old, I, I get that. But it's there, just because you don't think about it doesn't mean it's not there. Every single one of us, when we were born, the doctor could say with 100% certainty that you would die. They couldn't say when, they didn't say how long you had, but every single person who is born will die. There's one prophecy that will not fail. So the Stoics say that the fact that you could leave life right now has to determine what you do and say and think. It's why you can't waste time. It's why you can't be resentful. It's why you can't be unnecessarily busy, why you can't say yes to things that don't really matter. Memento mori, the fact that life is short and fleeting, that the time is tick, tick, picking away, is the reason to be present, to, to, to show up, to, to do your best, to not take any of it for granted. Mark Schmidt says, you could be good today, instead you choose tomorrow. We put things off, right, we delay. We, we are arrogant enough to think that we have forever. But right, you could blow out your knee tomorrow, right? The season could get canceled as it was for a lot of programs, right? A number of things could happen. And look, uh, people, people do get in car accidents. People do get diagnoses, right? Life is, that, that is a fact of life. And this isn't to make you sad. This isn't to depress you. It's not to be morbid, but it's to give you perspective. It's to, it's to remind you that this this moment is here. They call it the present for a reason. It's a gift. And are you going to accept it? Are you going to lock totally into it? Or are you going to fritter it away? Seneca, one of the other shows, says, let us prepare our minds as if we come to the end of life. He says, postpone nothing. Balance the books of life each day. Put on the finishing touches of life each day, and you are never short of time. Meaning, don't put things off to the future. Don't wait. Don't half ass it. Put everything you have into it. Live today as a full and complete life in which you gave everything that you were capable of giving the things that were in front of you. And the thing that really blew my mind, again, at your age, uh, understanding from Seneca, he says, don't think of death as something in the future that's way off, that you know, you've got 60 years left or 50 years left, right? Don't think of it that way. Because death isn't something in the future that you're moving toward. He says, actually, death is something that's happening right now. Not just because people are dying uh, all around us, as they tragically have been during the pandemic, but because, he says, the time that passes belongs to death, right? The time that passes can never be gotten back. Once you spend it, whether it's on a video game or a phone call or, you know, actually showing up for practice and being fully there and, and, and embracing and loving all parts of the game, even the frustrating parts, that's time that you never get again, right? So time is our most precious resource. It's the only non-renewable resource in the world. And so when Seneca says that, 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 that death is happening right now, what he means is that we're dying every second, every minute, right? So again, don't think of how many years you have left to live. Think about how many years you've already died, right? You've already died 20 years. How have you spent those years? Impressively, I would say, or you wouldn't be sitting here, but carry that sense of perspective and urgency with you as you go forward, right? Live, fully live, fully be here.
here for however much longer you have on this program. Every game that you get to lace up for, be there for it, because it won't be here forever, and none of us will be here forever. That's what the Stokes say, and uh, it's been an honor to share it with all of you, and I really appreciate it. You want more about Ego? Okay. When I think about Ego, the reason it's so important, everything that we do, like, but I'll, I'll take what I do. I have to make things that connect with other people, right? Uh, I have to make things that work in the market, in the world. So Kanye, right? Kanye can't be egotistical in the studio, but the music wouldn't be, right? He can be crazy when he's marketing, you can do all that, but at the core of it, when you make stuff for people, and you guys make stuff for people, right? You make it a product. This product is compelling football, right? A winning football team. But if you're in your own head, if you're obsessed with yourself, if you have no empathy, right? Empathy is the ability to think about what other people are thinking, put yourself in their shoes, to understand what the world and the market want. That's why ego is so costly, because it prevents us from being able to do that. And to do great work, whatever it is, you have to have that empathy. And I think you see this in coaches, right? Coaches who have lost, coaches who are so convinced with their own power, their own egos, their own uh, putting their own imprint on the uh, on the program, not really giving a shit about anyone else. Those are the coaches that have trouble connecting with the athletes who they have to get something out. I won't name any names, but you know, there's a college coach who went to the NFL and had you know pretty disastrous season. That ego gets in the way there, right? Ego prevents us from getting things out of other people, from making what we're talking about connect with other people. And that is the key skill in life. Uh, I would say, especially outside of school. Like, if you're an egotistical businessman or businesswoman or artist, you will not go very far because you are lacking the ability to connect with and communicate uh, with other human beings. Does that make sense? You want me to answer questions? I, I don't got nowhere to go. Yeah, I think that, you know, these guys go through things and the obstacles the way which, you know, to really make sure they understand that part. And maybe I've phrased it differently, like all the things that we think are bad. Yes. It happened to us as we get older, like this is it. There's no way, there's no way this can be good. This is the end of everything. And then all of a sudden years later, which search you don't even know now, yeah. they're going to look back and say that was awesome. Yes. Almost Not necessarily right. always awesome. That was really, it was I needed that. It was for who I became, right? Like every, everything bad that's ever happened to you in life led up to where you are now. And that's true for the things that are happening now also, right? So of course, nobody wants to get hurt. Nobody wants, uh, you know, to go on academic probation. Nobody wants to be criticized. Nobody wants any of the, the things that are quote unquote bad to happen. But everything bad that has happened to you in your life led you up to this moment, right? And so I think what we can what we can understand there is that can, we can give ourselves that gift right now and go, hey, this thing, it sucks, it's not what I wanted, but it's, it's going to shape and change who I'm capable of becoming. That we control. One of my mentors, Robert Greene, he's a, uh, one of the greatest writers of all time. He wrote his book, The 40 Laws of Power, and a book called Mastery. He wrote a book with 50 Cent called The 50th Law. Um, he said, look, the great thing about being a writer is that it's all material. He says, everything that happens to you in life, you get to turn into, into your work. But Marcus Aurelius says that in Meditations too. He says, what you throw on top of a fire becomes fuel for the fire, right? It turns it into flame and brightness and heat. And so if you can think about the things that have happened to you as fuel, as giving you motivation, giving you perspective, and they've done studies of, of athletes. You know, obviously, we, we talk about post-traumatic stress, but there's also a thing called post traumatic growth and athletes that come back from uh, severe injuries maybe they're not quite as fast off their left foot anymore or maybe they can't they don't have the same mobility in this way or that way anymore because of this or that injury but maybe it also gave them a perspective about the game maybe it it it, it forced them to spend more time watching uh, uh film maybe it, it forced them to connect more with their teammates maybe it just gave them maybe just reminded them that they're not going to be able to do this forever and they better, you know, take it seriously while they can. So the idea is that we can grow and change and use the things that happen to us, but only if we choose to see them that way. It's almost inarguable. You're going to use all of it in the future, 
right? You're gonna appreciate it 10 years from now or 20 years from now in ways that you can't really understand. So you might as well focus consciously on doing that right now and benefit from benefit from it in the short term uh, as well. Anyone else have questions? Do you feel like you have a geo problem? Is the best way to approach it? Yeah. Or, or do you think that is best? Sure. Uh, that, that, is, that is the trick part. I think, look, if you don't think you have a geo, then you definitely have a geo. Right? Like the most egotistical thing is to think that you don't have a geo. We all have one, we all struggle with it. Um, it's always there, especially as you become more successful, right? Because not only uh, do you have confidence in there, but you have other people telling you that you're amazing. Like all of you were the best from at what you did from where you came from, or you wouldn't be here. So uh, you, you, you experience that, but you have, I think one of the ways you keep ego at bay is by focusing, as I was saying, on where you can get better, right? So when you're doing stuff that's hard, that's kicking your ass, that's for, really forcing you to learn and be uncomfortable and change, um, it's hard to have egos, you know, seep in there. I think this is why, you know, Tiger Woods has reinvented his swing on three different occasions. So, yeah, he was the greatest golfer in the world, but there were moments in there where he was like, I can't even hit the ball because he was mid-attempt to reinvent his swing. So I'm not saying you have to go around trying to reinvent what you do, but if you're always focused on something that's really hard outside of you, if you're always focused on the work, the process of it, I think it keeps ego at bay. So I think that's one key way. And then the other way, and this has been very instrumental in my career, is um, who is the best at what you do? And like, how are they mentoring? So like, like Robert, uh, Robert Green is my mentor. I've worked for and with him for like 15 years now. Well, he's sold more books than me. He's better at it than me. He's seen more than me. He's had cooler experiences than me. So like when I'm around him, first off, he wouldn't put up with my ego, but it's also just humbling to be around him, right? Because he's always showing me all the things that I don't know. And so if you can also seek out wiser, older people who have been where you want to be, I think that keeps your ego at, at bay also. And, and it's just natural, it's both humbling, but inspiring at the same time. Because I'm around him and I'm like, this guy's so much better than me, he knows so much more than me, he's done so much, it's impossible to ever get where he is, but then it's also like, if I could just get a little bit closer, that would be amazing. So that process keeps it. And then there's a rule in writing, like your next book, or your last book never writes your, your next one, right? So this is why I think great coaches, like whether you guys win at the, shoot, at the Sugar Bowl or not, like Coach Kiffin is right back at zero starting over, right? And I think that keeps you humble. The, the fact that uh, it's, you're having to rebuild it always keeps you humble because you're not like, look at what I've done. You don't have time to sit back and rest on your laurels. You got, you know, recruiting to do uh, or meetings to sit in or film, you know. So if, if you're focused, again, always on the process, always on doing more good work, I think that keeps you humble also. So what's your stage that you need to present every fan of your life or is it more prevalent? Uh, Mike Lombardi, who's the GM of the, the Browns and uh, the front office for the Patriots, uh, I think he won, he won a ring with the Raiders and he won, he won with the, uh, the Patriots. He said, uh, ego is the leading cause of unemployment in the NFL, right? So I think definitely at high levels of things, ego is more prevalent, right? Because people are telling you you're great, you're making lots of money, you're famous, all these things. I think that's part of it. But I would say ego is prevalent everywhere. I mean, there's egotistical professors, there's egotistical people who work at nonprofits, there's egotistical people who are sitting on their couch doing nothing, right? Maybe that's why they're still on their couch doing nothing. But I, basically what I say in the book is that we're always in different phases in our life. We're like aspiring to do something, maybe we're at the top of what we're doing, or maybe we've just failed, we're just deal, we're at like rock bottom at what we do. Ego is going to be there, it's just going to feel and look different. You know, the ego of a 19-year-old uh, playing for Ole Miss is different than an egotist, uh, you know, an egotist football player who just won a Super Bowl, um, which is also different than, you know, somebody who just got kicked out of the NFL or whatever. But the, the ego is going to be there manifesting itself in different ways, and we have to be on, on guard for it always. The metaphor I, I, I heard and like for it is that 
It's like sweeping the floor. You know, you sweep it, you sweep the ego away, and then the room gets dirty again. And so, you know, it's always accumulating. You just have to be sort of constantly on guard and focused on that humility and confidence instead of just sort of giving yourself over to it. You believe the ego is fed a lot of lack of foundation, lack of values and beliefs and faith and really what your purpose is. I think that's right. Um, you know, when you have a purpose that's bigger than you, uh, that helps keep ego at bay because it's not about you, right? So I think if someone told you this is all about you, this is about you getting ahead, right? I'm doing what's best for me. That I think is a is kind of fertile territory for ego. But if you're focused on the team, if you're focused on community, if you're focused on the the, the guy or the the gal next to you, right? And about making them better, about making the whole thing better. Uh, all of that to me keeps keeps ego at bay. You know, for the Stoics, there's this virtue of temperance or uh, self control, self mastery. And so, if you're focused on that, I think there's things that an egotistical person you would never let yourself, you know, get away with doing. Do you know who I am? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, so, I, I think if you've got good values, it, it is a, a, an important tool in combating ego for sure. Cool. All right. I appreciate it, everyone. Good luck, guys. I hope you like this video. I hope you subscribe. But what I really want you to subscribe to is our daily Stoic email, one bit of Stoic wisdom, totally for free to the largest community of Stoics ever in existence. You can sign up at dailystoic.com slash email. There's no spam. You can unsubscribe at any time. I love sending it. I've sent it every day for the last six years. And I hope to see you there at dailystoic.com slash email.